Hello, my name is Matt Storr and I repair saxophones for a living. Um, it's been a little while since my last upload because I've built a new repair shop and I've also got a new camera set up so apologies in advance if this is uh, a little rougher than usual because it's been a while since I did it and I also don't know the intricacies of my new camera setup. With that said, this is a 1934-ish Selmer Radio Improved saxophone. Uh, the Selmer Radio Improved is the last sub-model of the Selmer Super Series, hence the SSS on the bell, um, which stands for Selmer Super Series. Now the Selmer Super Series was made from 1931 to 1935, uh, serial number 14,001 to 20,100, while the Radio Improved sub-model, uh, so-called because of the, that's the actual model, one of the few uh, sub-models of the Selmer Super Series, because you'll hear about like Selmer Cigar Cutter, that's not actually an official name, but as you can see here, Radio Improved is actually put right on the bell. Um, radio Improved, what does that mean? Well, uh, at the time, 1934, radio was becoming pretty big, and it's basically marketing. They made some uh, moderate upgrades, and as Selmer is wont to do, uh, they make evolutionary changes, and when it suits them, they change the model number or the model name as well. Um, and the radio improved probably seemed like a pretty good thing to say at the time, given that radio was so big. But uh, it has about as much to do with radio as a radio flyer wagon does, or a uh, Fender Telecaster guitar does with television. Um, it's mostly just marketing. Uh, that said, the radio improved is slightly different than the rest of the Selmer Super Series, and because it actually has the name radio improved on the bell, that makes it an official submodel, unlike the cigar cutter. Um, the Selmer Radio Improved, being part of the Selmer Super Series, a lot of which I'm going to say uh, applies to the Selmer Super Series, but specifically today we're talking about the Radio Improved. The Selmer Radio Improved is the last model uh, before the balanced action, if you're not counting the Jimmy Dorsey model, which is a rather rare and unique bird that we will not talk about today. Um, it is the, probably, the Selmer Super Series is the first Selmer saxophone with the sound that we consider of a Selmer sound, right? Some people will say that the um, Model 28s are the first with the sound, but I think the Selmer Super Series is probably the first Selmer saxophone that is widely regarded as having what we think of as the Selmer sound that is shared by the Balanced Action and the Mark VI. It is also the last with the old style keywork. Uh, the model directly coming after this one, the balanced action, is basically what is the template for all modern saxophone keywork. Um, the 1930s, uh, during which this was made, and I'll show you a balanced action just to compare real quick. So here is a balanced action, which you can see is quite similar in many respects. Let's see if I can actually move this so you can see a little better. The balanced action and the radio improved are quite similar in many respects. You can see the key work is laid out very similarly. In playing, actually, the measurements are quite close. Um, but the 1930s, in the saxophone world in general, uh, the art of saxophone making was turning into the science of saxophone making. Um, and ergonomics, intonation, and craftsmanship uh, were all on the upswing. As a matter of fact, the 1930s is probably my favorite decade of saxophone manufacturing. Uh, followed by the 1950s. Um, the craftsmanship on the Radio Improved is quite good. It is, uh, in most cases and in most places, uh, modern craftsmanship, as you would think. If working on a balanced action or a Mark VI, you don't run into any strange design decisions or things that don't work well or things that aren't built well. Um, if you've ever seen any of my other videos, I have a video about the Khan New Wonder Series 1. That is a saxophone that, in my mind, is firmly placed in the art of saxophone manufacturing uh, era, rather than the science of saxophone manufacturing era. Um, and it shows when you play it on the bench. It's not that they're not great horns, it's just that I complain about it because it's difficult for me to work on uh, and make feel like a horn with science behind it, rather than art. Now, the... Um, Radio Improved, much like the balanced action, has ribbed construction, meaning that you've got the key work here on the upper stack is all in this giant rib here. Um, you've got another rib in the bottom stack. It's got drawn tone holes, meaning the tone holes are pulled from the body. 
Um, it has uh, a different bell to body brace than on the modern Selmers. And this bell to body brace, you can see here actually, if you want to pause this, I'll try and hold it in a place where you can see it really good. That is an example of an unblemished Selmer Super Series Alto bell to body brace. Oftentimes these have been crimped or crushed together. Uh, this piece tends to come unsoldered quite a bit from the body, uh, which is a real pain in the butt. This is soft soldered though, so you can put it back on. You just got to take everything off and clean this real good before you put it back on because it does actually undergo a bit of stress. And also this key guard here is removable. There's a set screw here, a set screw here, and this triangular piece pops off and that's how you can work on everything underneath here. Um, and you can also look at this stem here that the key guard rests on and if that's pushed or pulled in any direction or if this is bent that's another indication that it has sustained damage this way. And I think because this bell to body brace is not super strong and also because these saxophones are coming up on 80 years old um, actually it's 2014 they are 80 years old now uh, a lot of these have sustained damage. So this is an example of one that is not. This is extremely clean and you can tell the lines here if you look at another one you can see that these are still really straight, very even. This is what it should look like. So if you need a template for what yours should look like, there you go. Um, the key heights that you're going to put on these are going to end up being moderate. You can see there's my lower stack there. There's my upper stack. Now I am not one that uses pre-measured key heights. Uh, I let my ears and my brain do the work because the horn will tell you what it needs. Um, interestingly, I did this balanced action uh, previously, and when I compared the two, I had ended up at the exact same key heights, which we'll come back to later, but that is interesting. The key heights ended up being, like, exactly the same. Um, the comparison of the neck between the radio improved and the balanced action is quite interesting as well. Um, if I take both of these necks here, and I try to hold them next to each other, back them up against the back of this plate here, you can see that the Radio Improved neck, one, has the octave pip in a slightly different location, and two, is a good bit longer than the Balanced Action neck. But if you look at the neck corks, you can see that uh, I tend to put my mouthpiece in relative to the tenon, relative to the horn, nearly the same place. And as a matter of fact, these tenon measurements are exactly the same internally and externally and I can switch back and forth the balanced neck and the radio improved neck and play either on either horn and in fact I have and much to my surprise they play very very similarly um, one of the things that people say about the radio improved or the Selmer Super Series in general uh, which by the way if you want to hear a tenor one of these in action listen to early Coleman Hawkins uh, but one of the things that people say about the Selmer Super Series in general is that it is like a broader, richer tone than the Balanced Action. But at least this radio improved alto, which I have overhauled, uh, and it's a fresh overhaul, and the Balanced Action alto I showed you earlier, which I have overhauled, it's also a fairly fresh overhaul, with the same key heights, they actually have the same resonators, um, sound nearly exactly the same. And when I A-B'd them back and forth, uh, I have a hard time telling the difference, and if I have... Uh, someone with a good ear in another room, they can't tell when I've picked up one horn and put down the other. And the same holds true whether I switch the necks back and forth or whether I just play the radio improved uh, neck on the radio improved and the balanced neck on the balance. But even if I play the balanced neck on the radio or the radio on the balanced action, they sound very, very similar. So in other words, you've got the Selmer sound that you're looking for, it's just that the key work is slightly antiquated. Now as far as the key work goes, um, the difference between the balanced action and the radio improved. One thing that actually makes it feel a lot more different than it is is the pearls. Okay, if you look at the shape of the pearls on the radio improved, they've kind of got a sharp edge. And then if you look at the pearls on this balanced action, and these are both original finish, they're both in very good condition. These are this is not worn. This is what it looks like these pearls have a more rounded edge and that actually feels considerably different under the fingers. Uh, it's much more comfortable on the balance than on the radio improved. But the locations of the upper and lower stack are quite similar and very easy to get around on. Um, and not surprising if you've played a modern horn. The only thing that feels significantly different is this left hand pinky table. 
but it's actually not that bad. I mean, once you spend a couple hours on it, you can get around pretty good. The most challenging aspect of it is that you've got a very small G-sharp, and obviously you can't roll around quite as good as you can on a, a modern keyboard instrument. But it's really not that bad. And when you think about the price difference between the Balanced Action and the Radio Improved, which is probably, depending on condition and what horn you're talking about, anywhere between you know two and four thousand dollars, um, the Radio Improved or the Selmer Super in general uh, starts to feel a little bit more attractive, especially considering you can get nearly the same sound out of it, um, if not the same sound, especially when you're talking about changing mouthpieces. I think there's going to be a bigger difference from one mouthpiece to the next than there is from a Radio Improved to a Balanced Action, if everything else is equal which is a very uh, difficult state to be in. Which is why it's so interesting that I overhauled both of these and separately arrived at the same key heights, which, like I talked about earlier. Um, if I'm using my ear and my brain to get the intonation and the tonality to be good, and two horns end up being exactly the same, that tells me that their bores and tone hole locations are similar. So, um, the things that you need to watch out for on this instrument. Uh, I'm going to actually take apart a little bit of it here. The Selmer octave mechanism, which you are used to. Whoops. Okay, so here's a balanced action. It's got the rocker mechanism that you're used to, right? Although it's in a slightly different location because they experimented with this mechanism an awful lot in the 30s until they kind of arrived at a standard design. The first Selmer octave rocker mechanism, which now is pretty much the standard mechanism that you find on any saxophone, first appeared in the Selmer Super. Specifically, usually you're going to see this on the Radio Improved, and sometimes on um, other Selmer Supers, but mostly on the Radio Improved. And if you can, if this focuses, which I think it is, it's a rocker mechanism, but it's actually geared. Is that showing up? Think so. The rocker and the two keys in the octave mechanism are interacting by geared teeth. And as you can see and hear, when it's in good condition and operating correctly, it is absolutely silent um, and it works beautifully. And you can see here when I activate this, there is no lost motion, no noise. It's very quick and it feels great. And honestly, this mechanism is probably the best Selmer octave mechanism ever made when it's in good condition. When it is in bad condition, it's probably the worst one they ever made, and I'll show you why. And pardon me for being silent here for a minute. This is always a finicky process. Okay. So we've got the octave key here and the portion with the rocker. And you can see those geared teeth right there. And when these are and this is what they look like when they're in good condition. So if you want to pause this and take a look. I think I've also got a photo on my website. This is what they look like when they're in very good original condition and when they will operate properly. Now, what do I mean when I say operate properly? Well, these geared teeth, as you can see, are complex shapes. It's not just like, whoops, come on, focus. There we go. It's not just like uh, two big geared wheels interacting like you might see in a grandfather clock. The way that this rocker moves relative to the key here, um, necessitates that these teeth be cut in a three-dimensional fashion where they've got some facets on them and uh, they are wider at one point than they are at another. Now, cutting gears is a very difficult thing to do uh, well. And if you're a machinist, then you know what I'm talking about. And there's actually also an entire branch of mathematics dedicated to gear cutting. So getting gears right uh, can be difficult. And in the case of this design, these gears have to be absolutely, totally correct to function quietly and well. And when these little teeth have been worn down, either by damage or misuse, or most often by buffing, they will not mesh correctly, right? They won't meet 
tightly. They'll be very loose, they won't fit well, and you'll have an awful lot of movement before anything starts actually happening. And that movement, if they're not always touching, right? Like I'm trying to make my fingers do it, it's kind of difficult. If they're not always touching throughout their range of motion and you've got movement, you're going to get click, click, click. And you can fill that up with oil if you want, but it's just going to dry out and get gummy, pull more gunk in there and make it worse in the long run. Now, that usually happens because the instrument has been buffed and these little tiny teeth have been abraded away. Um, and it, these teeth, the way they're cut, you can't exactly just like take out a needle file and make them better. Um, it's pretty difficult to repair. So that's why I say that when they are, when this mechanism is in good condition, it's one of the best. When it's in bad condition, it's one of the worst because proper repair is almost impossible. One of the things you can do um, is that you'll see that this ro this geared rocker is on a post and it's screwed in with a screw at the top there. One thing you can do is that you can buy putting a washer here on this screw, like a Mylar or Teflon washer. You can make it out of whatever uh, slippery, long-wearing material you've got around. You can adjust the height of this and you can press it closer, right? So if the teeth are worn, um, you can make them come closer together and sometimes that'll fix your problem at least a good bit, um, but not all the way. So like I said, this is one of the best Selmer Octa mechanisms uh, ever made when it's in good operating condition. When it's in poor condition, it's probably the worst because it's basically impossible to repair well. Now, um, pardon me for a moment while I put this back together. This is kind of finicky. Actually, I just showed you one of the things I was going to talk about. Um, you have to be careful that you have the teeth lined up correctly um, when you put it back together. Otherwise, the octave mechanism will sit funny. And apologies for being off screen here. It's just like I said, kind of a finicky thing to do. Um, so this is why th this mechanism is actually one of the reasons that I would recommend uh, in particular on the Radio Improved uh, getting a horn that is original finish. When they are not original finish, uh, they can be much more difficult to uh, get operating correctly. Yeah, I can't get this mechanism together. Of course, it's when I'm on video. Um, and that is usually something that is either extremely expensive to get right because it just takes forever and you may have to find someone with a good amount of specialty uh, or spe specialized skills or you're just going to be stuck with an octave mechanism that pretty much never feels right and only gets worse over time. Okie dokie, there we go. Sorry about that delay there. So another thing you may find on a Radio Improved is two different serial numbers. You can see on this one we've got a serial number on the bell, 19,000 something. And then we've got another one on the body underneath the D here, which hopefully you can see. And this is 12,000 something. Um, now on Balanced Actions and Selmer Super Series, uh, you've got, especially in the early balanced actions, you've got some that have the serial number on the bell. And of the horns in the balanced and super series runs that have the serial on the bell, you may also find a different serial on the body. Um, I probably get a call or an email at least uh, a few times a year of people asking if they have a saxophone that was put together from parts um, because they have two different serial numbers. That is not the case. These actually came from the factory like that. Only some of them, not all of them. Um, and the difference between the number here and the number here, uh, according to the data that I've collected, is usually somewhere between 6,000 and 10,000. Um, and no one knows what it means. People have ideas as to what it means, but no one knows for sure. Um, but it, if you see that on your saxophone, it does not necessarily mean uh, that it was not original. And as a matter of fact, I've never seen a saxophone 
uh, or a, a Selmer that had the two serials that wasn't original. So I think if you see that, don't worry. Um, let's see. So pricing on these models, on the radio improved. Depending on whether you're looking at an alto or a tenor and what kind of condition it's in, um, currently, probably somewhere between 2000 and 5000 Oh, an alto tenor, the radio improved only came in alto tenor. There was no soprano, um, baritone, bass, or C melody. If you ordered a soprano, baritone, bass, or C melody from Selmer, 1934-1935, you were getting a Selmer Super. Um, when compared to the balanced action, usually these models, uh, you know, an equivalent finish um, are between three and four thousand dollars cheaper. Which, considering that the craftsmanship and the mechanism, uh, for the most part, is completely up to par with the balanced action, uh, the design is very close, the sound is very, very close. Um, if you are willing to get around the antiquated left hand pinky table, um, which is really the last vestige of the old style instruments uh, left on the radio improved. Um, I would say go for it. Uh, they are very easily recommendable by me. Um, I'm actually considering keeping this horn, which is currently up for sale on my site, but um, we'll see what happens. I currently play on a balanced, and I've been switching back and forth between the two, uh, and although I find the radio improved a little bit harder to get around on, uh, I really like it almost just as much, um, and if I've got two horns where one is worth an awful lot more than the other, um, Plus, this one is relatively rare compared to the balanced action. Only made, you know, 1,500 of them. Uh, relatively few of which are still left around, especially in such good condition as this one. Um, and, you know, being a technician, I'm kind of uh, interested in horns that have interesting mechanical stuff like this octa mechanism. Um, this is something I might keep myself. But yeah, I would definitely recommend looking into uh, a Selmer Super Series, uh, especially the Radio Improved, which is the last model before the balanced action. So, I hope this was helpful, useful, informative. Um, today we looked at the Selmer Radio Improved, which is the first, uh, which is part of the Selmer Super Series, which is the first with the Selmer sound and the last with the old style keywork. Uh, very much a transition from the old to the new. And the Radio Improved being the last sub-model uh, and the rarest of the Selmer Super Sax. Um, if you have any questions, concerns, comments, if there's anything uh, you'd like to tell me or add to this, uh, Selmer lore is always much more um, complex and changing than most other saxophone makers because they made so many little changes over time uh, and they also have comparatively many people who are very interested in these small changes so I'm sure I missed something. Um, if I did and you would like to inform me please do because I'm always learning uh, and the more I know the more I can help people when they give me a call with a question. So thanks for watching.